All right, uh, so James, thanks for coming out early. We were just talking, thanks he's back from France, so if, if yeah. he nods off, uh, it's probably some time of, sort of, uh, time of day <laughs> issue. Give me a croissant. That's so. right. <laughs> um, so one of the things that, uh, just to start with, is why'd you write the book? Well, you know, my co-author, Nick Polson, and I are teachers, uh, and I think we first thought of this book really as a way to answer some of those questions that our students had about AI, which I've noticed in, in chatting with people tend to be the questions that a lot of people have about AI. Uh, and they're, they're nuts and bolts questions, things like, you know, how does a self-driving car work? Or how does an Amazon Echo understand what I'm saying? Uh, and, and we had noticed that there was a, a huge amount of writing about AI that was really technical and mathy. Uh, there was a lot of stuff that was kind of fizzy pop sociology. And then there was a lot of what to us seemed like uh, basically carnival grade fortune telling about what the robots of the future are gonna look like. Uh, but that if you wanted a, a non-technical introduction of how this stuff actually worked, or in some cases doesn't work, uh, you were stuck. Uh, and so I think that's where we started from, the idea that if you want to be a participant in the social policy and business debates of the 21st century where digital technology plays such a strong role, you have to know how this stuff works. Uh, and that's where we wanted to enter the fray, I think. And so, so you entered that fray, and one of the things I, I found interesting is throughout the book you have these uh, sort of comparison contrast between things that were quite old, yeah. all right, uh, the AI of the past and where we are today. And, and you bring up figures from 1600s, 1800s, Isaac Newton, Florence Nightingale. So, uh, you know, talk through that and that, that choice you made about what we can learn from those historical figures. Yeah, well, I think that, that one of the stories that we wanted to tell, I guess one of the meta stories that we wanted to tell was that while AI is Yes, partly about the technology, partly about the computers, and we can talk about those here in a moment. Uh, it is first and foremost a story of ideas, and most of the ideas involved are strikingly old when you consider how new these technologies are on the scene. I mean, take a self-driving car. I mean, that's something, I, I, anybody ever ridden in one? I had the chance to ride in one in Pittsburgh one time in a, in a self-driving taxi. That was pretty cool. Um, that's brand new, the first self-driving car that appeared uh, from Waymo. Back then it was Google, but they're the spinoff from, from Google. Uh, that, that hit the streets in 2009. But one of the key technological ideas behind how that works, we can date all the way back to the 1750s, uh, something called Bayes' Rule. And if you went through an MBA statistics class here at UT, you may have learned about Bayes' Rule. Bayes' Rule is the underlying mathematics behind how a self-driving car can locate itself uh, on the face of the earth. So that, that's a an old idea in new guise. Or if you think about some of the fraud detection technologies that are powered by AI that maybe uh, PayPal uses or some of the other FinTech or payment system companies out there. Isaac Newton was using almost dead identical mathematics in the 1690s to look for fraud as part of the work that he was doing with the Royal Mint where English coins were made. So you know, we, we thought that this intersection of old ideas and new technology maybe had a, an imbalance when these stories were told in the modern press and that it was all about the computers and all about the fast tech. And uh, we wanted to, as teachers and as, uh, as data scientists, we wanted to maybe recorrect that balance and, and point out that you know, humans have been using these ideas for centuries to solve problems. So if the ideas are this old and these applications, you mentioned self-driving cars and Amazon Echo, yeah. and these are new, so what's, what's caused this what, what seems mentally to me sort of this explosion recently yeah. um, in the availability of these kinds of things. Yeah, well, I think that's maybe the uh, characteristic of exponential growth, right? It looks the same <laughs> at all scales, but I, there's definitely some, some technological uh, progress that's been made, and, and you know, we could point to a number of things. The, the thing that, that Nick, my co-author, and I like to point to most are really the, the speed of computers and the scale of modern data sets. Uh, so there's lots of numbers out there that people quote in order to, to illustrate these. I'll give you some of my favorite numbers. Uh, when I was growing up, at least, uh, the, the cliche about computers was that you know, in, a, in a pocket calculator, you could have more computing power than they sent the astronauts to the moon. Uh, and this, at least with my students these days, doesn't resonate any longer. They kind of look at me and say, you know, what the hell's a pocket calculator? <laughs> so uh, here's the analogy that we use. It's a car analogy. So if you go back to 1951, the fastest computer in 1951 was something called the Univac. It was about the size of a classroom. Uh, and it could do, it was based on vacuum tubes, and it could do 2,000 calculations per second, which was radically faster than any human being could do, and was also a big improvement over the computers that had first appeared on the scene in the 1940s. Uh, the fastest car in 1951 was the Alfa Romeo 6C, and it could go 110 miles per hour. So if you fast forward all the way uh, to 2018, 
Uh, computers and cars have both gotten faster, but if, if cars had gotten as much faster as computers have done uh, in those intervening years, a modern Alfa Romeo would travel at eight million times the speed of light. That's the, <laughs> that's the pace of progress. Um, then there's data. So what, when we think of AI, we often think of the droids from science fiction, but in reality, AI today means the algorithms behind the scenes that are analyzing terabytes of data at scale on the servers of Amazon and Google and Apple. And the amount of data that has been accumulated, particularly image data, natural language data, data on transactions, uh, has skyrocketed. Uh, some, some numbers, again, here. If you were to digitize the Library of Congress, you would get approximately 10 terabytes worth of data you know, several DVDs worth of data, if you remember what a DVD is. Um, <laughs> however, in 2013 alone, the big four tech firms, which would be Apple, Amazon, Google, and Facebook, collected 120,000 times as much data as that. Mm. And that was five years ago, a lifetime ago in internet years. So when you put those two forces together, the speed of computers and the scale of data sets, you get that exponential growth. Uh, and it's a good thing that we have those fast computers too. Just to give you one example, if you've ever done a Google image search, you know, let me find pictures of an elephant on safari or something like that. The underlying image recognition models, that's AI that's used to sort of say, oh, here's an image, let's tag it as an elephant. Uh, we can recognize the object in this image. Uh, the models that were state of the art in 2015 uh, behind Google, there was a, a particular kind of model, they called it Inception, which they named it after the Leonardo DiCaprio film for reasons not worth going into here. Uh, Inception, <laughs> in order to tag the object in one particular image, uh, required 1.5 billion little additions and multiplications. That's for one image. So it's a pretty good thing that a modern gaming computer, you know, the kind that your teenagers at home might have if they play video games, could do 1.5 billion additions and multiplications in about 0. .00001 seconds. Uh, so when you put the data and the speed of computers together, that's what's powering modern AI systems. And the other part you alluded to earlier is this sort of public discourse and conversation <laughs> yeah. um, around AI. And how did, how do you uh, think about that public conversation and where are we in that and between a business or public policy element? Yeah, imagine my shock that you know, not everybody thought about AI the way like two data science geeks thought about it from the inside <laughs> of academia. Uh, I mean, we, yeah, maybe that's, that's kind of another reason that I think for us lent some moral urgency to the project of writing this book, aside from just being teachers. Uh, it was that we noticed that the public narratives surrounding AI were broken. I mean, on the one hand, you have an incredible amount of hype about AI coming from the business world. I mean, you've probably gone through Austin Bergstrom Airport a lot more than I have recently. <laughs> and uh, I'm sure you've noticed the, the rafters of the airport and Dell and all the local tech firms are hanging uh, banners from those rafters touting their AI. Uh, you know, we've probably all seen the, uh, the IBM Watson ads during the Super Bowl. And all of these ads and all of this discourse from the, from the private sector is sort of claiming that AI is going to solve all your business problems. And, uh, you know, fix the healthcare system tomorrow and, you know, make your toilet smell like roses and kind of do everything for you. <laughs> the, uh, the flip side of that narrative, of course, are the Elon Musks of the world and the kind of doomsayers who are saying that AI will destroy everything we care about, whether it's our jobs, our privacy, our democracy, something we haven't even thought about yet. Uh, and so I think that, that when you, that there's, there's not really a responsible middle ground out there mm -hmm. in, the, in the discourse around AI. Uh, and, and we thought that somebody needed to stake out some, some ground there, I think. Well, and, and to even have these kinds of conversations, you also have to, we have to reach some base understanding. Absolutely. Right, and that's part of the purpose of your book. But if you were starting from scratch, whether it's students or the general public, where would you start in explaining AI? Yeah, I mean, maybe I like to start with a technology that everybody has, and you know, smartphones are a bit cliche, so I'll ask, like, how many have uh, a, a smart digital assistant at home? Maybe an Amazon Echo or a Google Home? You know, okay, so if I ask this question next year, it'll be an accelerating number of hands that show up. Uh, we've probably seen the ads about Amazon uh, Echoes, right? Uh, you know, you can ask it, how do I make a spaghetti bolognese, or you know, Alexa, play me some 80s music, or, or whatever it is. So the way that those technologies work, that is AI right there. And if you think about how that kind of system is designed, uh, it is an incredibly sophisticated engineering enterprise. Uh, and what that enterprise consists of is a, a huge pipeline of algorithms. Uh, and an algorithm is really, really simple. I mean, an algorithm is just a set of instructions that are so simple that even something as dumb as a computer can understand it. Um, 
But when you chain a bunch of algorithms together in a pipeline, you get this illusion of domain-specific intelligence, like when you ask an Amazon Echo uh, to do something useful for you. So since we're here in Austin, right, let's talk about breakfast tacos. Let's suppose that you ask your home digital assistant, where in Austin can I find the best breakfast tacos? Well, that, what, that chain, that cascade of algorithms behind the scenes uh, that occurs when you ask your digital assistant that question is AI. The first algorithm is required in order to decode the sound wave into a digital signal. The next algorithm takes that digital signal and represents it as English syllables. Then it segments the syllables into words. Then it takes those words and represents the, uh, the meaning of those words. You know, that breakfast tacos is uh, a single, uh, single phrase that's meaningful in and of itself, aside from just those two words put together. Uh, then there's a search engine that actually queries and says, well, there, you know, there's Julio's, there's, uh, you know, Ned, there's, uh, I don't know, pick your favorite taco deli, pick your favorite breakfast taco spot. Uh, and then there's another algorithm that returns the answer and verbalizes it in a, in a non-robotic way. So this chain, this pipeline of algorithms, that's AI. And every single little link in that chain is an algorithm that's trained on vast sources of data. Data on natural language from the internet, data on uh, voice to text that humans have annotated, uh, data on search queries in Austin about who's searching for breakfast tacos and where they ultimately click on. Uh, and each one of those links in the chain is very, very strongly dependent on data. So I, and again, and every, any one algorithm is actually quite dumb uh, and very, uh, you know, there's, there, there's no, be no mistaking each individual link for intelligence, but the gestalt, though you put it all together, really does seem smart, at least to me. I, I still am amazed by an Amazon Echo. <laughs> Yeah, I'm, I'm more amazed now I can find breakfast tacos that way. Yeah, exactly, um, yeah. So, you know, you talked about, th with all that, and I think it comes through in the book, is this sense of optimism, <laughs> that we can find now the best breakfast tacos <laughs> in Austin very easily. It's a little more than that. Yeah, well, yeah. and you talk about, you know, I've, I, we've all seen those IBM commercials, for example, that yeah. Watson is this amazing thing that can do all things. Uh, but I also get the sense that you think it's going to be not quite that easy. Um, so could you talk a little bit about what, what is not so simple, perhaps, about getting to where this is solving all the world's problems. Yeah, I mean, it's, it won't be nearly as easy as the ads or the, the you know, rafter airport banners make it seem, that's for sure. Um, I mean, I get the sense when I talk with, with friends in the business community or maybe friends outside data science that the, even the optimists about AI are kind of encouraging a, uh, a narrative that, that is frankly unrealistic. I mean, people have this sense that AI, yes, it's software, but they have the sense that it's software that's kind of vaguely like Microsoft PowerPoint. You can kind of download it and double click on the, the, the app and it'll fire up and it'll just kind of work out of the box. And AI is not software like that. It depends very strongly, as we've talked about, on enormous quantities of very high quality data. Uh, you can't get by with just quantity alone and you can't get by with small sources of, low, of high quality data. You gotta have both to make an AI system work. Uh, and you also have to have a situation where the things that you can measure are very, very closely related to things that you care about. Uh, that's why Google and Amazon are successful at AI, because the things that they measure, click-throughs and purchases, are almost exactly what they care about, because they get monetized for click-throughs and they get money for purchases. In other areas, whether it's healthcare or education, the, the things that you can measure are a much fuzzier mapping to the things that you ultimately care about. Uh, and, and so I think that that's the, the big barrier, I think, uh, before we will see the wide-scale adoption of AI in and, and all of these other fields, is where is the data going to come from? And what are we going to be measuring? And I think if we make poor choices about that second question, about what to measure, there's no expectation uh, that AI will work any better than the old thing, which is upstairs. Yeah, and this, you know, our understanding of AI is often burdened by this, what seems like a sometimes impenetrable technical uh, yeah. a hurdle. Yeah. And I, I joked with James before we got started that the, you know, the book has this warning up front about math in the introduction. Yeah, um, maybe, maybe a bad choice from the standpoint of uh, sales. But, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> so um, for, the, for the, whether it's those of us in the crowd or for policy or for business, What's the one thing you'd like for us to take away that maybe doesn't require too much technical expertise? Yeah, so I guess, I mean, I'll, I'll try to put my hat on. Imagine that I were a, a business owner, a manager without a lot of technical expertise trying to navigate this, uh, this environment. And, and maybe the number one piece of advice I would have is to 
beware of, of what I might call the AI vendor hacks here. Uh, this idea that we, uh, that we talked about here, that AI is not just PowerPoint, it's not something you can download and, and work out of the box, that's a misconception that's actively fostered by this enormous ecosystem of consultants and vendors and software companies and, uh, and what have you. Uh, who, who make it seem like you just flip a switch and this is going to solve all of your problems. That, oh, you download this natural language processing software and all of a sudden a chat bot is going to take care of all of your customer service interactions. Or you buy this vendor's product and all of a sudden you'll have real-time demand forecasting for all of your SKUs if you're a retail company. And that's just not realistic. Uh, and I think that, so, so if you're in that position, my number one piece of advice would be to come back to these two bedrock criteria of what makes a successful AI system. Huge quantities of very high quality data and a very close mapping between what you care about and what you can measure. Without both of those pieces in place, I would be willing to make a bet at reasonably high stakes that AI is not gonna work for your problem. And one of the things you, you mentioned before was this, the, trying to get it right between what we care about and what we measure. Yeah. And you alluded to healthcare. Uh, there's also, I, I would think, cause for optimism around healthcare. Could you talk about some things that are perhaps promising in that, in that space? Yeah, I mean, my research uh, tends to be at the intersection of data science and healthcare and operations and a lot of these things. So I, I've kind of found myself on the front lines of, of a lot of both the possibilities and the frustrations here. I mean, I'll give a, a few examples of how just as a, a consumer of healthcare, you might see AI start to creep in. Uh, the number one thing that everybody talks about in the machine learning community is imaging. So if you imagine going in, you tweak your knee uh, or your shoulder or some kind of joint, you have an orthopedic issue, and you go in to get an MRI. Uh, right now, that's read by a human being to, to classify. I mean, well, that's a classification problem. Uh, you look at the MRI or the series of cross sections of the MRI uh, and looking for a ligament tear, looking for some kind of telltale sign of a physiological damage. That is the perfect scenario for machine learning algorithms to come in and work Frankly, better. Uh, you know, the, there's, if you think about the sheer number of MRIs that have been read and annotated in the medical databases of the world, that's easily the kind of scale that machine learning algorithms would need with sufficiently high quality and sufficient scale to be able to do, I would suspect, better than the best uh, diagnostic radiologists out there. Uh, that's not to say that there's not going to be room for human radiologists, uh, but that the more run-of-the-mill uh, tasks in that kind of discipline are ripe for automation uh, by AI. And that, that image analysis motif occurs throughout medicine. If you think about, I mean, MRIs are just one. There's CAT scans, there's PET scans, there's histology slides uh, in a histopathology lab. If you ever uh, or have a loved one uh, maybe gone in to get diagnosed for cancer and there's a biopsy, there's a histopathology slide where they're looking at the cellular structure of the cells they take out of that biopsy. That's another classification task based on an image. With enough data and enough high quality annotations of those images, I would expect, you know, certainly over the next decade to see that largely uh, in the province of, of AI algorithms. And we went, um, the university took a group to Asia this summer mm -hmm. And the dean of the medical school, Clay Johnston, went. And many of you may not be aware, but Dell Med here on campus has a pretty, I think, aggressive, revolutionary take on healthcare. Much. He made the same comment you did, which is essentially, in my mind, boiled down to think twice before you go to study radiology in the traditional sense. Yeah. That uh, things are going to change there. Uh, but one of the challenges I know that Dell Med faces that that this brings up is the healthcare system itself. Um, and so what, what's, what's there that you can see or that you've thought about that may be a barrier or cause a slow uptake of, of these kinds of ideas? Oh, where do you start, right? Uh, I mean, I, I think that you know, I would not be the first one to observe that there are systematic incentives in the American healthcare system that prevent the uptake of good ideas. Uh, you know, things that tend to be expensive and make a lot of money, tend to get up to, uh, taken up pretty quickly, but things that might be preventative or uh, kind of against the vested interest of the individuals involved tend to see slower uptake, even if at a system level they would be uh, more cost effective. And I think AI is, is one of those examples. I mean, we talk a lot about this in the book, and, and there are some really easy wins, some really low-hanging fruit out there. I mean, right now, if you think about the, the electronic health record system that, systems that have been set up at most hospitals, most clinics, most, most healthcare systems across the country, it takes about three clicks for a doctor to send you a bill. Uh, but if a doctor wanted to do something like 
call up the historical records of the kidney function of a patient who's come in for some kind of chronic disease, be it diabetes or cardiac disease or, or something like that. I don't know how many clicks it would take. It would certainly not be a natural way. To, I mean, just imagine a scatter plot, right, where you're going to look at time along the horizontal axis, and you look at this patient's kidney function over the last 10 years on the vertical axis to see, is it going like this, pretty safe? Is it going like this, which is indication of problem? Three clicks to send you a bill it would probably take hundreds of clicks to get that, and a lot of expertise with an electronic health record system for a doctor at your bedside to be able to pull up that kind of scatter plot. Uh, and so if a human can't even do it right now by analyzing those kind of health records, we certainly don't have the kind of systems in place where a machine might be able to look at historical records and flag impending signs of chronic disease. Uh, and, and there's other, you know, that's a long, a slow burn time scale, you know, the, the, the scale of, at which a chronic disease comes on and, and starts to get expensive and, you know, all of a sudden, 10 years later, somebody needs to be sent to the ER for emergency dialysis. But there's also slower, uh, I'm sorry, faster time scale kind of issues as well. One of the most expensive problems in, in hospitals these days is hospital acquired infection, sepsis, is something they think about a lot. Uh, and the, the the kinds of scores that an intensive care unit would use to decide whether you were at risk of sepsis are not even 20th century statistics. We're talking 19th century statistics right here. The kinds of improvements that you could make by using 21st century machine learning technology to make predictions about whether somebody is likely to go septic uh, could save, well, I don't want to put a number to it, but let's, let's say there's a lot of zeros at the end of that. Uh, and that's just one problem, sepsis. You imagine that for heart disease. You imagine that for crashes. You imagine that for fetal distress using data from a fetal heart rate monitor in an obstetrics unit. Uh, the opportunities for using AI and data much more effectively than we're using it now are legion in healthcare. Uh, and I have to say, frankly, I've been a little bit depressed at the, the slow speed at which these ideas seem to be taking up. Mm -hmm. And that's this mix of sort of upside with some structural issues to get yeah. over. Uh, one of the other things that you discuss in the book is sort of the, it seems the downside or some scary examples of how I'm, AI might be used. Um, and there's a disturbing discussion in there about Florida and right. use of AI to sentence felons. Could you talk about that and what concerns you there, what they're doing? Sure. So, so let's. Uh, I'll give you just a little bit of background here. Uh, there is Broward County, right? It's a famous county in Florida for a number of reasons. Famous in machine learning circles for this particular episode. I'm about to tell you. Uh, so, uh, Broward County judges have, for a number of years now, been using machine learning algorithms to help uh, set sentences for convicted criminals. So what does that actually mean? Uh, the, these are algorithms that, they're classification. So if you took a stats class and you're trying to predict, uh, you know, a, you, you've got data on, you know, who defaults on their mortgage or not, or who dies or not in a clinical trial, or, uh, you know, who hangs up the phone at a call center. It's exactly that same kind of problem, a classification problem. Here, the classification problem is which criminals are going to commit further crimes if they're released from prison and which criminals aren't. Uh, and that's a, that's a decision that judges have been making for as long as there have been justice systems. You know, is this person a threat to society? And, and doing some attempt at, at quantifying that, even if informally. And now in Broward County, they've started to use machine learning algorithms uh, for that quantification. Those algorithms look at data on a, uh, on a criminal, uh, their past criminal record, even some facts about their family, which to me seems wrong, and we'll talk about that here in a moment. Uh, and it makes a prediction about whether that criminal is at high risk or low risk of recidivism if they are released from prison. And that, it's just a black box, right? The, in, the data about the criminal goes in and the prediction high risk, low risk comes out. It's just that binary state right there. And the judge uh, is allowed to use that in order to make their decision about what kind of prison sentence that a convicted criminal could use. Uh, so that's, that's the background right here. It's just machines doing what humans have always tried to do in making judgments in the criminal justice system, but formalized and quantified using data on past criminal convictions. So uh, you might say, you know, that there's a lot of potential there. Uh, we know that historically there have been enormous biases in the criminal justice system, uh, particularly against African Americans, uh, but, you know, against all sorts of marginalized groups. Uh, and, you know, the... the sad trail of statistics that we could quote to quantify that. So you might think, well, if humans are, are, are biased decision makers, uh, maybe machines might actually help there. So there's actually, I mean, I, I think that there's some promise for that, both there and in a variety of other areas. What's the problem in Broward County? So two things. First of all, 
uh, there's now a track record of this algorithm uh, on how it's predicted on uh, convicted criminals and what those convicted criminals go on to do. And there was a very disturbing pattern of racial biases in the classifications made uh, by this algorithm. Uh, and this was, this was, it wasn't me doing this analysis. This was uh, ProPublica, the journalistic organization, doing this. Uh, what they noticed was that among those criminals who were wrongly classified as high risk, so these are criminals who were classified by the algorithm as high risk, but did not go on to commit future crimes. African Americans were disproportionately represented. Whereas among criminals who are wrongly classified as low risk, so criminals that the, the machine thinks you're not gonna commit a further crime, and they do, whites were disproportionately represented. So the, the different types of errors, false positives versus false negatives, are falling in a biased way upon different groups. Uh, and in a way that, that kind of reproduces the biases that have always been in the criminal justice system. So that's a problem. Now, I, I happen to think that that's a problem, that it is, it's, it's great that we notice this, because it's something that we've been living with forever in the criminal justice system. And I think it's, it's good when we've got a machine who's making those same errors, because they're subject to analysis and correction in a way that a human's decision making has never been. Uh, but here's the other problem. Uh, uh, they're not doing that, for one thing. There's been no legal scrutiny of this, as far as I can tell. Appeals courts have continued to allow this uh, algorithm to be used uh, in, the, uh, in the justice system in, in Florida. Here's the other big problem. Uh, the algorithm itself is secret. It's just as secret as the secret sauce that goes into Amazon's uh, demand prediction algorithms or Google's page rake algorithms uh, or Apple's uh, voice detection algorithms. Uh, and to me, that is wrong. If a machine learning algorithm classifies you as high risk and you're sentenced to a longer jail term as a result, you can't even ask why or scrutinize the workings of that algorithm under appeal. To me, this is a moral travesty. I mean, in America, we don't even accept secrecy in the algorithms that they use to rank college football teams. I don't know why we would accept that secrecy in an algorithm used to send somebody to prison for a number of years. So I take a couple of lessons from this. One is that while there is very real potential, you know, you cannot treat these algorithms the way you would treat a microwave oven, just by like punching in some numbers and, and walking away. You have to have humans who understand these algorithms, understand their biases uh, at every step of the way to make sure that justice is being done rather than injustice being perpetuated on the basis of human error that has been in the system for centuries. Uh, and, and the other thing I take away from that is that openness is key. We cannot have people being sentenced to jail or denied credit or denied admission to college on the basis of an algorithm whose workings are secret. That's interesting. And then you know, that one of the other areas where bias often creeps up is, uh, is in terms of how we hire people, how, how yeah. labor markets work. And you know, we think about this a lot in the business school. We're in the you know, job of training our students who then go out into the world and, and do great things. And I, and my, as I go on the road, I hear more and more talk about various ways to sort through this human capital pipeline yes. and try to very cost effectively and efficiently figure out who, who, whom we should talk to or not talk to. Can you talk about the role of AI perhaps in that, in that context? Well, I think AI in that context could make, uh, frankly, enormous strides in fairness. Uh, you know, what, what does a human have to, I mean, think about the, the position of an HR manager or you know, here in the university, we hire a new assistant professor using, the, using this model. There's a stack of, of resumes that's probably four or 500 resumes high. Uh, you have a very limited amount of time to look at each one. You also have a very limited understanding yourself of what in that resume actually predicts ultimate success in the role that you were trying to hire for. Uh, that is a, a tailor-made situation for all kinds of human biases to creep in. I don't mean explicit racism or sexism or homophobia here. I just mean the implicit biases that we all carry around with us and that social science has documented kind of beyond a shadow of a doubt exist in just about everyone. Uh, and I think the, the record of human decision making in those kinds of realms is frankly needing a lot of improvement. Uh, if you've read Freakonomics uh, you know, a couple of decades ago, uh, one of the famous examples in, in Stephen Levitt's Freakonomics was the, the resume experiment where they sent identical resumes out to a bunch of, uh, of companies who are hiring except they put on the top of some resumes stereotypically white names and on the top of some resumes stereotypically African American names. Well, guess, guess which stack of resumes got higher callback rates. Uh, that's nothing but bias could account for that. 
uh, you know, an, uh, an algorithm that could be blind to those kinds of irrelevant features of a, of a candidate uh, would, first of all, make the biases uh, not as bad uh, if indeed we can solve some of those problems that have come up in Broward County. Uh, but it also might, frankly, do better at figuring out what the real features of a person's record and knowledge and history actually predict success at the role. And you know of any examples of organizations trying this yet? Or where are we in that, in that journey? Yeah, I, I haven't studied this problem, but I, you know, I can tell you a little bit about some of the research that's out there. Uh, so there is a, uh, there's a, an economist at Columbia called Bo Cowgill, uh, which I, I, that's an awesome name, by the way. I mean, <laughs> Bo Cowgill should be playing quarterback at the University of Texas, and <laughs> instead he's an economist at Columbia. Uh, so Bo, Bo Cowgill ran a study at uh, a big software company and being a software company, they were kind of more open to experimentation and machine learning and kind of new ideas about how to do HR. Uh, and so uh, Bo Calgill kind of uh, reported on this experiment in a, in a paper he wrote uh, where he called it AI versus HR. So here's how this, this uh, setup worked. Uh, the company, since it's a software company, they need to do uh, basically like a day-long technical interview uh, with candidates, with coders who are going to show up and say, hey, I can code, I can help do software engineering at your company, well, let's figure out if you actually have the chops and, and know your stuff. And that's an expensive interview process. You're talking five or six engineers who all take time away from their jobs for a day or two and do a deep dive on this person's technical skill. So there's a screen up front, and that screen historically uh, had been done by uh, an HR division within that company. Uh, and so what, what they did was they, uh, they took data on the, the resumes and who ultimately the engineering teams hired after their technical interviews. And then they did an A-B test. Mm -hmm. uh, arm A was the old process. The HR team would scrutinize the CVs and decide, here are the, the folks that we think are the best candidates for the technical interviews. We'll send them on to the team of engineers and see whether they get hired or not. And arm B of the A-B test was, let's train a machine learning algorithm to do exactly the same thing. Well, a number of months and years later, uh, when all the dust settled uh, on that experiment, it turned out that the machine learning algorithm had an 18% higher chance of leading somebody uh, to the, uh, the engineering team who ultimately got hired. And what was even more striking was the way in which it made its decisions. Uh, here's the story you might tell yourself about AI versus HR, that only a human being scrutinizing a CV or a person's record could find the diamonds in the rough, the people whose maybe surface level qualifications uh, might not be so impressive, but there's some signs there of greater engagement or greater knowledge or, or grit or, or whatever it is that we think predicts success. Whereas a machine is just going to look right over that and it'll go for the Harvards or the MITs or the, the traditional qualifications. Exactly the reverse. It turned out that the differences between the AI and the HR hiring uh, decisions were that the AI had done radically better at finding the diamonds in the rough. People with non-traditional qualifications, people with maybe a certificate from Coursera or a degree from South Dakota State rather than MIT, that nonetheless had what it took in order to succeed in these interviews and ultimately be a productive member of the company. So you know, I, I think that that's, uh, that is the thin end of a wedge. I think, in terms of the way we make decisions, not just in HR, but uh, not just in criminal justice. Uh, I think of uh, uh, myself on, on the role that I've sat in on scholarship committees or admissions committees to honors programs or graduate school uh, promotion committees. Uh, and when I think of the task that I face, I think I could use a lot of help. And I think uh, one last question. So those of you that uh, want to be thinking of your own questions, uh, you know, we're almost there. but. As you think about the audience, and I know the book is really, I think, one of optimism um, with some caveats we've discussed a little bit about today, but what would be the f a final message that you'd want uh, this group or other readers, perhaps, to take home about AI? Uh, I, I am incredibly excited about the future, which is maybe not something you hear a lot these days, given the political narratives and the state of the world in a lot of ways. Uh, a million people a day leave poverty. Uh, if you compare over the last century, in 1900, the average American did 59 hours a week of housework. Today, it's 14, and AI is set to continue that downward trajectory. Uh, if you look today, the number one predictor of social mobility in America is having ownership of a private car, and I think AI-powered transportation networks might break that very, very tenacious and very socially undesirable correlation. 
I think we, we need a, an injection of upward mobility in America these days, and I think that the kinds of technologies, the kinds of resources that people in the upper middle class and, uh, and the rich classes have had for years and years and years, whether it's educational attainment uh, or access to digital technology, the, the diffusion of those technologies, I think, will be an immense wellspring of human progress in the years to come. You will see... Um, you will see better medical technology in the developing world. You will see better access to transportation here at home. Uh, you will see better tools for learning and decision making that will help us all be smarter, better, wiser people. Uh, I am tremendously excited about what the future of these technologies will bring and for the direction that we are going. Great, thank you. Uh, with that, let's open up for questions. And as Emily mentioned, we are uh, recording this. So if you don't mind coming down to the mics that way, we can get them recorded. And uh, what would you like to ask, ask James? Good morning. Thank you for your time. Of course. I actually have a couple of questions, if I don't know if that's OK. Um, my first question, you know, you talked about Broward County and the challenges that are happening there. And we've heard other situations where bias comes into play. So from a layman, um, is that simply because humans are the ones creating the algorithms and we're just carrying our bias into that. And if that's the case, how do we ensure going forward that that doesn't happen? Great question. Where does the bias come from? It, right. It's not obvious at all. So let me put it this way. It's not some racist coding the algorithm. That's not where the bias comes right. from. Uh, the, the algorithms themselves are neutral. What the algorithms learn to do is find patterns in the data sets on which they are trained. So if you're asking, in that particular example, where does the bias come in, it comes in at every stage of the justice system. I mean, uh, maybe you're, uh, you do or maybe you don't believe the social scientists who have studied these issues and, and say that an African American is more likely to be pursued by police uh, as a suspect of the same crime, uh, more likely to be prosecuted uh, if arrested for the same crime, and more likely to be convicted if tried for the same crime. So if, if you buy all of those things, then it is obvious why there would be a bias in the system. Uh, because even if the algorithm itself is not allowed to know about race, and it's not, uh, any machine learning algorithm worth its salt will try its damnedest to find proxies for race. Uh, and you know, given the sad history of the criminal justice system in this country, the proxies are abundant. One of the things that uh, the Broward County algorithm is allowed to ask is, do you have any family members in prison? Well, there's a pretty strong proxy for race right there, and it can easily reinvent the patterns of bias in the data set on which it's trained. So, well, you know, what do I take from that? You can't, again, you can't just run these and, and, uh, and treat them like, you know, PageRank or treat them like Amazon. Uh, you have to have more scrutiny along the way. Humans and machines thinking together, you know, the, the, the humans can scrutinize the pattern of decisions made by the algorithm and make tweaks in order to redress the, the imbalances. That's something we've never done with human decision making. Uh, or if we've done it, we've only done it in a, a kind of decades long systemic review of procedures uh, in the criminal justice system. You know, new constitutional amendments, new laws that protect the rights of the accused, those kinds of things. Uh, we, we can do much better than that on a retail rather than a wholesale basis, making sure that bias doesn't creep in at any stage. Okay. You have a follow up? I, I did, but okay. I Okay, we'll go over here and we'll come back. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, my question has to do more with the human element uh, uh, with AI. You mentioned that AI can help place uh, engineers in a, a structure at a corporation. Or uh, If you take that a step farther, like my son is four years old, uh, let's say that AI has been gathering data about him uh, his entire life and to the point where he can say, hey Siri, what type of career should I choose? Or Siri, who should I marry? Or uh, do, you f do you think that that is like removing, almost removing the human element from our decisions? D does that actually enhance uh, who we are as a human or, or would that be like maybe detrimental to to society? Well, I think if it gives your son a chance, a greater chance at living a life of happiness and fulfillment and flourishing with a partner he loves, I'd be all for it. I mean, I, you know, the record of human decisions in these realms is not so great. What, what are the, what's, the, what's the divorce rate in America right now? Uh, so, now, now look, what would it take? It's not just going to take data on your son. It'll take data 
like long longitudinal uh, studies of people uh, of what early life features predict uh, later life happiness in various careers or with various types of partners. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, it's going to take data not just on your son, but on millions of other sons and daughters out there. We don't have anything close to that right now. So it goes back to the, the two key criteria. What do you need in order to make AI work? You need enormous quantities of very high quality data. High quality here would be in the whole time series, like from birth to, to marriage to hopefully no divorce, but maybe, right? Uh, or, or kind of, and, and there it's also the question of, of what is the metric? Like what, uh, if the, the things that you can measure are very, very imperfect proxies for the things that you care about. I mean, is divorce a good enough proxy? I doubt it. All right, a lot of people kind of just get by and, and uh, still remain married. And uh, some people just kind of cruise through for years in a career, not particularly enjoying it, uh, but not leaving it either. So what are you going to measure there? Uh, you know, I wouldn't necessarily be optimistic that it's going to work anytime soon. But if we could, and if it improves human happiness, two thumbs up. <laughs> nice. Thank you. Hi, good morning. Um, so a lot of times when we, <clears throat> excuse me, when we hear about AI, we hear about the career choices that are going to flourish with AI and then the career choices that are going to kind of just go away. But you seem to have more of a neutral ground and you seem to me to be uh, advocating that AI is going to uh, help any career choice or any um, job and any person do their job better. So is that, is, am I getting that right or do you think that there are going to be some jobs that become obsolete and if so, what, what do you think they will be? Yeah. Well, I mean, I think many things, it's a continuum. And I should say, I, you know, I'm not the expert here. Uh, and and you, should, uh, you should, I think, take with a grain of salt any projections about what AI is going to do to the job market. I mean, I'll just, I'll come back to your question, but I'll just tell you this little tidbit. As part of researching this book, we did kind of an informal meta-analysis of all of the forecasts that various uh, organizations had made about the effect of AI on jobs. And what we found was all over the map. You know, the Bank of England said one thing, McKinsey said something else, the Federal Reserve said another thing, the Cambridge Computer Science Department said an entirely different thing. And what was striking about these is, you know, some of these were attempting to be good scientists and say, here's my estimate, you know, AI will gain 250 million jobs or AI will cost us a billion jobs. And they would, they would try to put some error bars. What was really striking about this meta-analysis was that you would have like one estimate over here and the error bar is about like this and another estimate over here and the error bar is about like this, right? Which is telling you that these are completely fictitious estimates and completely fictitious error bars. So what I take away from all of the, the people who are frankly more expert at that job and labor economics than I am, when they try to make predictions about this, they don't have a clue. And that the, uh, all that the presence of this you know, vast spectrum of predictions is, is really an invitation to cherry pick in the service of some rhetorical agenda that somebody has. Now, let me come back to your question, and uh, I'll give you my take on this. I mean, there's a joke in AI that uh, the easy things for a machine are the hard things for a five-year-old and vice versa. Right? So, uh, you know, emotion and intuition and creativity and, uh, you know, facial recognition, you know, these things, machines are getting better at some of these, but, uh, you know, humans still have a, an enormous edge in some of these areas, like reading subtle emotional cues and, and those kinds of things. So, um, take that for what it's worth. I, I don't have any, any strong formal predictions about what the job market is going to be like. I think there are certain, certainly specific areas, and I'm not the first one to say that trucking as an industry uh, is maybe in trouble, uh, given the effectiveness with which cars, I'm sorry, with computers can drive cars these days. Um, that's one that I'll throw out there. But you know, I think there'll be an enormous uh, reservoir of jobs that'll be created by AI as well. I and mean, I think in healthcare alone, about the number of new data scientists, the number of, uh, you know, frankly, kind of blue collar level work that'll be necessary in order to annotate data sets for the purpose of training machine learning algorithms. That's a, an enormous source of social and financial value right there. And it'll take an awful lot of labor, human labor, to get it done. So I'm not worried. I mean, I think that like any technology, there will be short term dislocations in the labor market. I'm very much in favor of uh, government intervention to, to smooth out the worst of that. Uh, and make sure that, that we have uh, a just society uh, in, the sake of, uh, in, the, in the face of these dislocations. But I don't think AI will be any different than any other transformative technology. It'll put downward pressure on wages in some areas, upward pressure on wages in others, and meanwhile, it'll grow the slice of the pie for everyone else. Um, 
I don't know, maybe I'll, I'll go with my favorite John Updike line here, which is that America is a vast conspiracy to make you happy. That's, uh, that's kind of what AI is. <laughs> Thanks. And, and it's better to be a five-year-old. Yeah, that's yeah. right. <laughs> Maybe so, yeah. yeah. Thank you for presenting on this uh, fascinating topic. I'm curious, and my question I think will appeal to the plan two part of you. Okay. Uh, who is regulating? Who's making the ethical decisions about AI? And are we training people appropriately for those roles for the future? Great question. I think it's certainly fair to say that the pace of regulation and the pace of thinking about this has lagged behind the technological capabilities that we have. Uh, right now, uh, I don't think we have a particularly strong legal framework uh, for regulating these technologies. And what's there, I think, tends to do more harm than good. I'm thinking particularly of the kind of laws that prevent the pooling and dissemination of healthcare data. Um, I mean, I, I get the, the sensitivities there, uh, and I, I think that's a whole other discussion that we could have. But um, right now, I think most of it falls to the individual researchers and companies involved. Uh, and this, you know, who knows why, you know, different people have different takes on this about whether, uh, you know, government regulation in the face of that kind of scenario is more likely to help or more likely to create uh, you know, opportunities for the big companies to uh, seek more rents, uh, you know, regulatory capture and, and regulatory exploitation, that kind of thing. I, I'm not smart enough to know the answer to that question, uh, but I do know that there's, uh, it is kind of the wild west when it comes to regulating this stuff right now. So first question and last question, you get it, you get oh, your, your book ends, yeah. so go ahead. Uh, well, thank you for that. So. My question, I don't know if you're familiar, Amir Hussein, he founded Spark Cognition, a local AI company, and he, I know he's talked a lot about public policy needing to, and I think he's actively involved with moving that along. So getting back to the displacement, um, you know, people who, the job market will change, right? And you just articulated that, what will be needed and what will no longer be needed. So what do we need to do from a public policy standpoint to make sure that we are preparing people for what the future holds in terms of the job market. Well, that's a deep one. I wish I knew the answer to that. <laughs> I mean, I have a few thoughts. I mean, I think that, um, you know, one big thing, well, why, why is it so fearsome in America to lose your job is because you also lose your health care. That's a big thing, right? So I, I think uh, yeah, that's, that's a... That's a something that is unique to the United States of America, and I think it is uh, that that fact plays, I think, at least some explanatory role in the greater sense of skepticism that Americans have about this technology than when you go ask the Swedes, for example. Uh, and the, Sweden is a great example of a, of a country that has very strong digital privacy regulations uh, and yet still is able to produce a company like Spotify, a you know, cutting-edge, AI-powered uh, digital company. Um, so they've made different choices about how to govern themselves, and I'm probably not smart enough at comparative government to say exactly what those are, but I do know that there is precedent. Uh, you know, Estonia has some of the, the most advanced e-government in the world. South Korea has been able to uh, kind of maintain, uh, you know, drones out of airspace while still having one of the most uh, sort of advanced development economies for drone technology. I mean, there's precedent all over for uh, smartly regulating new technologies while still harnessing the, the best of what's on offer. I, I, I wish I could say I were the expert on this topic. I'm probably not the right one to ask, but I, 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 I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic about where we would go there. Good. Thank you very much. Yeah. Great. Thanks, James. I hope you all will agree. I think uh, I have learned more before 9 a.m. than in a, in a typical day. Uh, so I, I appreciate it. And a great way to kick off our, both our series and our day and the first of this kind of event in Rolling Hall. So please join me in thanking Professor Scott. Thank you all for coming. <laughs>